The Last Word with Stan Collymore. Stan Collymore! Oh, yes. Telling it as it is. Instead of tweeting and putting on Instagram that Collymore's this and Collymore's that, go and tell us. No holes barred. Oh, Stan. Pure, unadulterated Collymore. And Stan Collymore strikes. I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by a man that is uh, uh, twice a hero for me, because once uh, Aston Villa, uh, all of my heroes are villains, uh, having been a, a Villa supporter since a kid and lucky enough to play for the club, but also Celtic. The last 10, 15 years have been fascinated with everything Celtic um, for many different reasons. So I'm delighted, Stillian Petrov, you've, you've joined us um, today on The Last Word with Stan Collymore. Um, I want to get an idea for our listeners because they automatically see now so many players coming into the Premier League or into the Scottish Premier League or, or other parts of the UK. And they see players, whether it be from Eastern Europe, from Latin America, Western Europe, settle in, go and play, it must be easy. But of course it's not quite that easy. You, you, you have a situation whereby you come from a, a completely different culture and a different footballing culture. Um, you have to learn a language, you have to get schools, you have to, for your kids, you have to settle in. When you moved to Celtic, one of the world's biggest football clubs, um, you didn't speak English. So how difficult was it in the first phase for you to settle into Glasgow? Well, first of all, it was uh, to make the decision to make that step, you know, to go to a different country. And don't forget, I was only 19 years old. Um, I was living on my own since I was 16. I moved to CSK Sofia. But moving in Bulgaria was easy. You speak the language, you know the, 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 the people, you know the nature, you know everything. Everything is familiar. But moving to a different country is completely different. And for me, I had it easy. I decided maybe sometime I say I'm, I'm, I was too naive. I didn't think what was the con consequences and what, what, what to expect really. The problem with that this year in Bulgaria was about about our idols, and we had the great idols in in Bulgaria it was Stoichkov, mm. Balakov. The night, if you remember, the '94, you know, absolutely we fantastic team, yeah. great, yeah. Um, and I wanted to be like one of them, and uh, I was given the opportunity to move to a club like Celtic. Did you feel that you had to move abroad because CSK Sofia is a you know it's a big club, it's a it's a club known around Europe. Did you think? 19 years of age, I could stay until 21, 22 and move, or did you feel you needed to move at that stage? I had to move. I had to move, and it was, uh, it was important for me to move and develop in a different way. Because in Bulgaria, um, everybody, everybody was talking about me, that I've got the talent, I can make it, that it's something special. It was me and Martin Petrov at, uh, at mm -hmm. that time were coming through together. Uh, Martin already left uh, to play in Servette uh, mm. in Switzerland. So the offer came for me and I went, that's me. I had to go. Did you know uh, anything about Glasgow at that point? Uh, not much. I knew about Celtic. Uh, I didn't know much about uh, Glasgow, uh, but it was some experience. You know, people talk about, you know, footballers, both of us, we went through it. We've seen the good life, we've seen the bad life, we've seen money, we've seen, uh, we've been dealing without money. Yeah. I had to leave and I didn't have a penny in my pocket. I had to leave because I loved football. I wanted to develop as a player and as a person. And for me, it was the perfect opportunity. My first experience was my agent and the deal, perfect. Um, he said to me, we have an issue with the visa. You have to just train on your own, wait for it. I met with him only twice. He all, all obviously kept me about, you know, how everything's going. Is the visa is going to happen or not? Is that quite sudden, stressful? Because it was, it was obviously stressful. now we know. We again, we automatically see players come in, but you don't realise that particularly outside of the European Union, you have to have a a, a, a work visa, and you have to have so many caps as an international, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you were training on your own. Uh, on my own, um, I was nervous about it because I've signed the contract. Uh, I couldn't get paid because actually I don't have the visa. That was the agreement. He came a month later, no visa. Two months later, no visa. Three months later, a young boy, uh, nervous to go to the different country, a new club. Visa is not happening. I don't know what's happening. And all of a sudden, visa is done. 
you have to go. So I was sent on the plane on my own to go through Brussels. I got lost in Brussels. <laughs> I had to catch another flight. Had you been abroad much at that stage? Uh, yes, but as footballers, we look, we get looked after. Yes. You know. Turn up here, 10 yes. o'clock. We start at 10.30, finish at 12. Uh, meet here at such and such, be on the bus for... The same as the travelling as well. Yeah. Be at 8, eight, eight o'clock at the airport, drop your back in a check-in, you already give your passport to the player liaison, he check you in, you go through this uh, gate, that's where the plane is, everything is sorted, it's perfect. But all of a sudden, young Stan have to travel <laughs> on his own. No word of English. I got lost in Brussels. Um, I landed in Glasgow. Come out, the guy who's supposed to wait for me was late. And what I faced, my first step going out from the, from the airport was all the media. Everybody's waiting for me. The mics were on, on my face. And the Scots, talking. let's not forget, have a very um, feisty tabloid media like in England. It's kind of the sun, the mirror. They're, Scotland still has this, I mean, it's, it's the same with the Scottish national team. We've seen them getting beat by Russia recently in Belgium is that the Scottish media still talks because the Scottish national team is the equal oldest in the, in the world with the English FA, is that they still talk about the Scottish national team as if it's a, 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 a big thing. So it's a very, very feisty and febrile media environment in Scotland. It's, um, you know, the media are proud to show that Celtic or Rangers are signing somebody. They've got a signing excitement. And don't forget, at that time, they had the two big names as a manager and a coach, mm. which is Kenny DeGlish and John Barnes. I'll come to that they in were, a second. They were talking about, you know, how, how good the Celtic will be. They would, they would challenge Rangers again. They had Mark Viduka, Eo Berkovic, Lebo Moravcik, great players. Yeah. And all of a sudden, a young boy coming in. So most of, the, most of the media didn't know anything about me. They've seen me playing against England. They've seen a couple, couple games, you know, at that time the social media wasn't mm-hmm. that big. You can't find really much about somebody. So they wanted to know about me. But unfortunately, I couldn't say a word. I couldn't say anything. I was just standing there, lost, panicking, Did sweating. the give you a tra- translator? Uh, no. <laughs> so you were literally no. thrown in the deep end yes. in, in also one of the most difficult places to learn English, probably in the British Isles, because I love Glasgow and I love Glaswegians, but you only have to listen to a Kenny Dalgleish interview or a Sir Alex Ferguson interview to know it's a very, very difficult way of learning English. It was very, it was very strange, Ron, because at that time, so it was, as, a, as a foreigner, most of the, most of the guys were speaking good English. They, they were quite experienced, they were international players. So they, they could settle and live their life without, without even having problems. Mm. But I was just 19. I was there, no word of English. And this is, was the biggest problem for me. Not the, the challenge that I was facing ahead, it was the language, that barrier that I couldn't communicate, which made it really, really difficult for me. You mentioned John Barnes. John Barnes is my captain at Liverpool. Going to go and interview in a, in a couple of weeks about many different issues in the game and a very uh, erudite talker. Um, and Kenny Dalglish, a Celtic legend, a Scottish football legend, uh, a British football legend and a Liverpool legend. Um, the dream team. When you get signed by two guys like that, um, what did they say to you? What did they want from you? How did they express that they wanted this young kid to play for, for, for Celtic Football Club. And how difficult, a supplementary question, was that how difficult was it for you when it didn't work out for them? Um, I think it was difficult for both sides because first of all, I didn't want to disappoint. Secondly, they wanted to take the best out of me. But that barrier, the language barrier was very difficult. We, we couldn't understand each other. They tried to help. I couldn't understand. Everything had to be done on a, on, a, on a little desk. They, you know, they were showing me with the, uh, uh, little things and drawing with the markers, you know, how I need to play. What I, yeah, what what I have, to, you have to do this, you have to do that. So it's really difficult because don't forget, you, you, you're dealing with, I'm only 19 years old. I'm going there, I try to do my best, and then all of a sudden you see two legends, which as a young boy, I was a Liverpool fan. Mm. So you see John Barnes and Kenny Daglish, mm. you know, standing in front of me. You don't want to disappoint them. You don't want to let them down. But in the same, t- in the same uh, 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 side, is they can't help you. 
because communication in sport, in any business, it's a big thing. And if you can't communicate, it's very difficult to put your messages, your philosophy, or whatever you want to somebody. And that was the difficult part between me, John, and uh, Kenny. So you've, 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 let's fast forward a little bit. We'll come, we'll come back to John and Kenny and, and, and Celtic. But I, when I played, for example, Aston Villa, we, uh, I think we were one of the last all English teams under John Gregory. Or British Isles teams. We had uh, Fernando Nelson that was Portuguese, uh, a right back. And that was pretty... Savo Milosevic had played up, up, up front. Uh, Dwight was Trinidadian, but he'd, he'd had all of his uh, youth in England. Is that when you're in a dressing room, and I haven't had this at Liverpool, we had several foreign players, but not many. So the vast majority of my career was uh, British Isles-based players with the odd Norwegian, or uh, they tend to speak very good English. How difficult... When you then learn English, um, you get to Aston Villa and you're a, you're a senior figure, but still players are coming from left, right and centre. How difficult is it for all of these people to communicate in a dressing room? It's, it's very difficult, but when, uh, when I moved to, to Aston Villa, having the experience, what I've experienced with, uh, with Celtic, you know, seeing the, the problems and the difficulties that, that I had, you just try to adapt and make sure that when somebody comes and don't speak langu uh, the language or he don't kind of understand a lot of the things, you have to be patient, you have to help him, you have to make sure that not just f uh, football terms you have to learn, you have to learn to communicate with the other people in the team because if you don't know your teammate, it's very difficult to open up, to be a good teammate, to perform together. And that's the, that's the, that's the hardest job for me when I was at Villa, you know, especially when I took the captains, it was very difficult with a few of the players, you know, communicating. You know, as a player, and we talk, you talk about a lot with the a mental, mental mm. health, and mental, a lot of players come with, with a lot of problems. Mm. And people don't realize that. It doesn't mean because they've signed a contract and they've, they've given a lot of money that that solved their problems. Everything is in the head. And the problem, of course, is exacerbated if you can't speak the language, if you can't communicate that very well. Of course. If you can't share, if you can't have help, then it becomes very difficult. And uh, we have a couple of issues in view, a like couple of players that struggle, you know, mentally, you know, to get, to get going. But when they get going, you can see the potential they have. But sometimes you think, but what happened if we weren't there, if we didn't help them? These players will just get lost uh, in, in, in football without even showing their potential, which is a very, very fine line how you can communicate and how we can help people. Um, let's go back to Glasgow. Um, I, I, I read, so I, I like to do a lot of prep and read. I know about most of my guests <laughs> anyway, because I'm interested in them and, and particularly interested in, in, in you and your career and coming from a, a different country, adapting to a different culture, the goldfish bowl that is Celtic Rangers that dominate Scottish football. Um, Tell us about the burger van, because the, I, thought, I, I could have understood this story if it was 30 years ago, because you hear of players getting on the bus with the fans and going to the games and stuff. But we're talking about the modern era, you're a big young signing from Bulgaria, you're playing, playing for one of the world's biggest clubs in a, a, this huge goldfish bowl of Glasgow. But you learn a lot of your English from a burger van. How did that happen? It's a strange uh, thing, you know, we're talking about big clubs and uh, you know how they are set up and they look after the players these days it's perfect it's all done the players all done all there you can't complain about anything but before it was completely different uh, so I got injured one day um, in the game and um, one of the security guys security guys who worked for Celtic he, he, he noticed that I, can't, I couldn't explain to the physio what happened to me so the game finished, I was coming out, and that time I, I just started to a little bit understand things, you know, going through difficult, uh, I went through the difficult um, uh, um, time. So he said to me, would you like me to take you home? I said, okay. So since that day, he drove me every day mm -hmm. from training back home and in the morning from home to training. And he said to me, we're going to start learn, uh, to learn the language. I said, what, what do you mean? He said, we're going to start learning. I saw that you struggle to explain what's happened with you. So let's start with the parts of your body. So you go in the morning, you touch my hand, and you go wrist, and you go elbow, and you go shoulder. And we'll go through every, all, the, all the parts in the body, little simple things. Then we're going to take it to the next level. 
And the next level is his wife. He owned a, a burger van, and his wife and his older kids were working on that burger van. So one day, we sat down, and he said, "I'll let you order, you know, in the restaurant." I couldn't because, I, first of all, I was shy, but I didn't know what to say. Mm-hmm. For me, it was not natural. So he said to me, "I'll tell you what we're gonna do. Let's go in a, after training. We're gonna go to the burger van every day. Every every day, people place order. Mm-hmm. So." You know, you may may I have, can I have the bill, the change, everything. So you're going to learn it nicely. I've learned some great things. I've heard some bad words. I was going to say in Glasgow, <laughs> it's not about burgers and chips and coffee. It's about a deep fried Mars bar. I know, I know. And uh, listen, it was uh, it was a great experience. And, uh, and did you learn? Of course, of course. I, I know, you know, how to order polite, when to be a little bit more great. You, you know, you learn and you understand how people act. You know, you, you see somebody, you know, sometime we'll have a day off and we'll go in the morning but you see some people coming you know from a night out and you know they'll be they'll be funny they'll have a language they'll have a laugh and they'll order in a different way and you're just gonna pick up different things and for me it was a great experience i've learned so much and it was incredible experience but if i have to do it again i'll do it again did you gain confidence from that because obviously again about communication um confidence is a big issue so going up to a burger for saying i would like i want whatever the formal or, or, or informal is. Did, you, did, did it make a difference to you settling in Glasgow and expressing yourself on the football pitch? It made, um, it made a great difference because I was meeting more and more people and then uh, I would start to have a communication with people. Then my language was getting better. I was getting more confident. And, you know, when we're in football, what's the worst thing that we're in football? People judge us, yeah? Mm-hmm. That's the worst thing, you know? People judge you if you're good enough at that. But when you go to, like, I'll say to people that actually don't want to judge you, they see you there, they'll have a laugh with you, they'll speak to you, they don't judge you there. They actually see that you're making an effort to learn the language, to do something that will help you improve, which is, which is the, great, the greatest thing for me. And I, I could be more relaxed there. Being in a dressing room is very difficult because you have to watch what you say, how you say, who you say it to. And this is a big thing. That's why... Being in open out there, you know, sitting around the urban around, having conversation with people, and listening to conversation to people, seeing how people act was the best thing that happened to me. Dalglish and Barnes didn't work. Um, I think that by their own admission, it didn't work. Nobody's quite really sure why, because they say two legends go back to a, a in Kenny's case, goes back to a club he knows very well. John Barnes, his first real job as a as a coach, and then Martin O'Neill comes in. And of course, you worked with Martin twice, very successfully at Celtic and at, and at Aston Villa. What did what was the difference between this Northern Irishman that came in? I would imagine with uh, Seamus McDonough and Steve Wolford and John Robertson. Here I was, I love Robbo, absolute legend, Nottingham Forest legend as well. What was the difference in when Martin O'Neill walked through the door from when Kenny and John walked out? His man management. Uh, believe in the, the, the believe in players, um, the desire, the intensity you worked in. This is the biggest thing. Um, you know, the funny things is I always tell this story, and he always say he, he always hammer me if we do a question and answer event, and that he always hammer me. You know, the first training session we did a blip test, and um, he thought I was one of the masseurs because I was overweight and I've dropped in a in a, a level eleven, and he thought I was one of the masseurs. So he actually had to go to the doctor and say, well, who is the monsieur they're doing the blip test? And Rory McDonald had to clear with him that I'm one of the players. So, but the funny thing is, a week later, uh, after a week training, um, Martin pulled him in, 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 in his office and um, he said to me one thing, and he was a straightforward. Very intense, very always intense, looking down. Yeah, getting never his, quite get, sure. Getting his uh, yeah. glasses up. He was looking down and going, still here. I just want to tell you one thing. First of all, I think you have a good potential. I think you can be a great addition to this club. You're a young boy. You've got a good, good amount of potential that you can develop. But I'll tell you what, I will give you six weeks. Now is our preseason, six weeks. And you have to be lighter, nine kilos lighter than what you at the moment. And you have a chance to play for me. I'll tell you what, for these six weeks, I had to work, I have an individual program, I had to work twice as hard as everybody else. 
bear in mind in, in, in the preseason, you know, you have to eat, you have to reload, mm. you have to do everything. Double sessions, yeah, it's hard work. I was living on grass and dust. <laughs> I had to do it. I didn't have a other choice because my start with Celtic was so disappointing for me, myself. I had to do it. I didn't have a choice. And he was giving me a choice, which was good enough for me. And you know what? I had a great preseason. Uh, everything was going well for me. Martin O'Neill, after the second game, he pulled me in in his office and he said, first of all, I would like to tell you that you've done great. Uh, I would like to give you a new contract because I don't think you, you deserve what you get paid at the moment. And you know what? Since he told me that and he gave me the opportunity, I was ready to go through any war. Yes, straight away. And you know what? I've never looked back. I've never even had a doubt about going out on, on the pitch and fight for him. Injury, no injury, I was there. If I could move, I'll fight for it. It's very strange because I had a, a, a lot of different managers at different points in my career. And I was only with Martin for six, six uh, months before he went to Celtic. And it was at Leicester and I'd, I'd been bombed out at Villa and I'd be training with the kids. And it's exactly the same. By the time that I left, I would do anything for him. John Hartson, we had a chat with last week, exactly the same, he'd do anything for him. Um, that's quite a rare trait in a manager that not only that you respect him as a coach and you'll do this and you'll do that and you do as you're told or you're scared of him or you like him because of the way he interacts with you but how many players that have played for Martin O'Neill at very different clubs at very different times all felt that he that you would run through a brick wall for him what do you think it was about him as a person because he wasn't happy clappy he wasn't everybody's best mate he was actually the opposite so what was it about Martin O'Neill he was just a great human being he treated everything the way it deserves. If you do the work, you play. If you don't do what I want you to do, you don't play. It's very simple. If you train, you play. If you go on a Saturday and you win me the game and you perform well, you'll be, st you'll be standing that team. If you have a 50 games, you'll be playing 50 games. If you look at Martin O'Neill's record in every club, Leicester, Celtic, to every club he went, he plays with pretty much the same same team. And people will question that down down the line. Especially like, because in the day and age of rotation. Of course, it was of one of the criticisms at Aston Villa. Yes. Let, let's come to that at Aston Villa. So you, have, you have great success at Celtic. And then it's time, as many players have done, we've seen Virgil van Dijk go down south. We've seen Victor Wanyama go down south. Paolo Di Canio, Pierre van Hooydonk, a number of players that have particularly done well at Celtic, but also at Rangers that then come down south. You go to Aston Villa, by this stage, you understand the language better, you are going to be working for a man that you already know in, in Martin O'Neill. Um, what did you first find in Birmingham? What did you first find at Aston Villa? What were the differences between going from one great club in Scotland that, that dominated with another to one of England's biggest clubs? You know what, it was similar clubs. And uh, I was um, I was on the way down to Portsmouth. I was actually going to sign for Portsmouth. It, Villa wasn't a, a, on the map at all. Uh, he was manager at that stage, uh, Harry. Uh, Harry Redknapp. Yeah. And that time he was going for Gareth Barry. Mm. Was at the moment he was Martin O'Neill was negotiating with uh, Gareth to stay, but also Portsmouth wanted Gareth as well. Mm. And I was on the way down two days before the, the transfer windows uh, closing. Uh, I was on the way down just before the international break. And then I had a phone call from Celtic to say that, that the deal was switched and Villa are ready to pay bigger fee for me. Mm -hmm. So now I have to go and negotiate with Villa. And the one thing that Martin you said to me is, at the moment, Villa are in a building process. They've got a takeover. They have ambitious... Um, Randy amb Lerner. Ambitious, yeah, uh, um, a chairman would like to achieve stuff with the club. He wants to take the club to where he belongs, you know, to challenge for... Yeah, for I think the, the, yeah. The, the aims when Randy Lerner came in to, to uh, consolidate and then be in a position to qualify either year in, year out in Europe, whether that be the Europa, uh, UEFA Cup, Europa League or the Champions League. Yes, that was his intention. And um, he said to me, it will be difficult two years because a lot of players will go out, a lot of players will come in, I'd like to bring some young talent, players that it can give us legs and it can give us help and they could be more creative going forward. So 
the Sunni said uh, I was happy to do that because I was moving with from one club which had the the ability to fight every day and to dominate to win stuff to fight for for, for cups medal everything that comes you know uh, ahead of them and there's a very healthy expectation always at Celtic of course and when you play in front of the Celtic fans you want to go to a club that other fans are demanding yeah. Celtic fans and I moved to a perfect fit I moved to a club that had ambitions a club with a great fan base and the, the history, fans tradition. history tradition exactly you can match it with anything you want and for me it was a, it was a really really easy choice when I spoke with Martin and he said if like he, he laid in the, uh, laid in the plan and said this is what's going to happen this is how I'm going to do it I want you to be part of it no problem what were the differences between the SPL and the Premier League I suppose the obvious ones that come up is uh, that there's a greater degree of competitiveness but did you settle in fairly well in terms of the week in and week out grind uh, of the Premier League not really uh, I knew it was going to be hard uh, better individual players better physicality in the league much faster so if you compare the Scottish League with the, with the Premier League you can see that every component of the, you take speed, mm. physicality, quality, individual players, everything is better. Mm. So if you played well in Scotland, you have to raise your performance by three times. Mm. So for me, I had a good start. First 10 games was, was brilliant. I had a good uh, debut at West Ham, everything was going perfect, but then, that process that Martin was talking about, you know, players going out, players coming in, that's when I start to struggle. Why? Because then I was moved white right. For me, I know my strength and I know why, why, where I can be useful for the, for, the, for the team, for the club. Did you tell him, I mean, there's a big debate at the moment with, I mean, it happens with many players, um, but I wrote in a column that I do for the, for the Mirror the other day about Marcus Rashford, Gareth Southgate sees him what, Harry Kane down the middle, Raheem Sterling dropping a little bit deep, and and Rashford left or right. Ole Gunnar Solskjaer has said to him, "We want you as a to now learn your trade as a number nine. When you are, when you see yourself in one position, central midfielder, like to get forward, like to score goals, um, but the manager says we want you to play here for a spell, wide right, wide left, deeper. Do you do you dig your heels in and say I want to get in this team by playing this?" Or are you just happy to play in the team and you say, well, I'll give it a spell and see where we go? Um, difficult, you say now. We, we may, we're going back to what we say about Martin Neu, what is Why is he so special? We're talking about that we'll do anything for him. So when you're a player, you just want to stay in the team. He, when he was told me that I'm going to play in the right, I was going, yeah, I'll play in the right. That's the, going back to, again, to the answer that your question is, what's the difference between Scottish football and English football? Mm. Big difference because at Celtic I've played a number of times and all right, but the full backs is not as powerful, they're not as quick. Mm. You know, all of a sudden I'll, I'll face to play Ashley Cole. Mm. I mean, hell, how I'm gonna take uh, 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 Martin only one of we were playing Chelsea and he was going to me, Stillian, take him on. <laughs> I went, Gaffer, how do you want to take me on? I can't pass him, he's too quick for me. Only way I can do is play one, two and try to outrun him. It's very difficult. So I have to keep coming in. He said, I don't want you to come in. I've got enough me to. you playing wide now. So this is the difference and how good is this league. If you think that you can go, up, go and play out of position in this league, completely wrong. Captaincy. Um, a great honour to, to, to captain any club, never mind one of, one of England's old great clubs. Um, how did you find out you were going to be captain? Um, was there a conversation? Was it just a case of one day being past the armband and right, you keep it or what have you? Um, and what did it mean to be captain of Aston Villa? Um, privilege, honour. Um, I want more well, high that, uh, that I was chosen from, from the team to be a captain. Um, I Why do you think you were chosen as a captain? Um, it must be the quality. Everybody have the different interpretation about a captain. I take captaincy as a very serious, serious position in the club because you are the assistant of the manager on the pitch, mm. you know, especially on a game's day, on the, on a, on a, uh, days of the game, because that's where you, the manager went, they do all the, all the work through the week. But on, in the game, most of us, you know, they'll shout, you don't care. But when you have a captain who can guide you, lead you and act in the right manner, 
then you want to follow him. You want to look at him in your eyes and say, he's there to help me. He's there to either push me or hold me. And in, the, in the dressing room, do you have to go around people? I played with some great captains. John Barnes at Liverpool, Stuart Pearce at Nottingham Forest. He was a classic sort of show us your muscles and I'm going to you know, shout at you. What was your style of captaincy in the dressing room? Communication. Um, Which was, is incredible, bearing in mind that full circle of the journey yeah. coming to Glasgow and not speaking a word of English. You could now communicate in a foreign language in a leadership tone. Uh, is that how you learn? That's why you learn what is important and what kind of leader you are and how you would like to lead. Everybody lead in a different way. I thought that was the, my strength and that's what people buy into what I how I'd like to lead. So it was, it was very, very important for me. But I'll go back to you. The, well, the biggest moment for me as a captain, the biggest challenge for me was under Gerard Ollier. This was the biggest captain. And I had to swallow my tongue. I couldn't do anything about it. He didn't play me for nearly three and a half months. When you're a captain and when you achieve a lot as a player and as an individual, you've got the right to say things. But I felt in that moment, these three and a half months for me, I had to be the perfect captain and the perfect teammate. Right. Charlie Austin we interviewed this week and he was being shoved out of Southampton. He stands in the dressing room with Ralph Hasenhutl and says, you've told me to go and change with the under 23s, but you haven't given a reason why you've, you've dropped me. So they had a, an argument and it was well reported and Charlie spoke about it as why he, he, what he needed to say in front of the dressing room. You're saying, you're captain, you take the role seriously, you take leadership seriously, but you also still want to lead by example. So he decided politically it was better to lead by example than say something in front of the gaffer in the dressing room, which is very normal in football, in the football environment. Of course, we because uh, nobody, nobody likes to be uh, push down. Nobody likes to be treated in a, that way. But the managers are different. They look after their own interests. Mm. They like to win games. They, they think that what they do is the right thing. And you, have, as a captain, as a player, I've always respected. But this time we were in a very difficult position. We were only four or five points of the of the relegation. Every 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 game was a scrap, and I couldn't help. I couldn't help because I wasn't given a chance, and it wasn't for me. It wasn't given that. He haven't given me a reason why. Did, this you is go the, to, did you knock on the door then and go in and see him in his office? No. I wanted him to approach me and to tell me why. But I, I knew why. Because at that time he bought uh, Jacques McCoon, mm. who's a very good player. There's nothing against the player. I don't have nothing against the players because that's our jobs. I think you'll find Villa fans would have a Stan Petrov rather than a Jean McCoon with the greatest respect to Jean I understand McCoon. that but end of the day that's, that's another thing yeah. I knew how difficult Jean came his English wasn't very good he have to integrate into the team he have to understand he have to set a lane so it's a lot you have to do and as a captain that's your role you're part of that I couldn't go and so keen but I knew what, I know one thing and I've learned one thing that in football a little thing change very quickly mm -hmm. football things change very quickly so I knew when you go in a team like that and you struggle to get results you know there's going to come a time that the manager has to make a change so I had to act every morning I'll go in I have to see them I have to smile I was burning inside I didn't want to go and be, be there I didn't want to go to training but I'll tell you what I, ha I had to I had to because the boys as much as the managers are making decisions the boys still felt that I'm there for them. I'm their leader. They want me to be around them. You know, sometimes, you know, I won't go in. You know, sometimes we'll lose a game and I won't even feature in the, in the team. And I'm like, and I need to go in and, and clap everyone and say, you know, you've done well. And, you know, somebody playing in my position, I had to go to Jean and give him a, a, a hug and go, you've done well, don't worry about That's it. That's great captaincy though. You, you have to, because you're part of that team, because things change very quickly. Three months later, I went everywhere. Three, in these three months, I had to work twice as hard everyone because I knew that when my time come, I just couldn't give him another reason to drop me. And I remember... It when was did that come? What was the game? Uh, it was funny how, it's funny how he came up. Uh, 
I always done all my running on Thursday because I wanted to make sure, obviously, if I don't play on Saturday, I'll be fit and mm -hmm. I've done all, enough r running. So we had a, a little hill that I was doing a power work, a lot of sprinting, just to make sure that the legs will work in the same intensity as the game. So when my opportunity come, I'm ready. So I can see the manager and just before Newcastle game, if you remember, we beat them one yes. and we went on a nine, nine, nine game win and we managed to, to survive. So I could see him coming from, from far back. And that week he's been very nice to me. He's, all of a sudden he starts speaking and you, you know straight away what's coming. Jean has been under pressure, the fans has been under pressure and I start asking questions. So I was doing my, uh, my, my little drills with the fitness coach. And about to bear in mind, the fitness coach was a great, he was a French man. We had a great relationship. Mm -hmm. He could see what happening, but obviously he's the part of the, the coaching staff. And I would never go and speak against the manager with him because he's part of the staff. Mm -hmm. For me, it's not his fault. It's not his fault. in a very difficult position exactly. as well. So I'm doing my, uh, and I can see him coming. Yeah, that's just nice little slow walk like he always walk so I can see him behind me and he got uh, Stan just to let you know you've done very well in training this week <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just laughing inside but every, I, every I, ex pro and yeah. every pro that will hear this voice yeah. has been left out of a team and then has been dragged back will have had that conversation yeah. and know what's coming yeah it was like you've done a great end this week you look sharper you know what I'll be careful what you're doing today. You may have a chance to start on Saturday. And I knew straight away I'm starting. So I went back in and all the boys, I could see them sitting in the, in the pool, you know, doing the recovery when I was doing my run. And I'm looking back with him and all the boys are just laughing and that. Uh, and since then I went back in. Um, unfortunately, it's uh, what happened with, with Gerard after. And you know what, when he got recover, that's where you know he's, 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 a, he's a man. He come back and I say, you know, what? I've done wrong, one wrong thing. He's not explaining why, why I drop you. But you know what? You never moan. You never complain. Fair play to you. I have a lot of respect for you. You know, that was enough for me. And then you know you've done the right thing. I could easily go on the other way, you know? And it was probably going to be the wrong thing. And I would probably, by the end of the season, I would have left. I would have never played again. And uh, this is the moment that you decide, do you want to go in the direction that you think is right for you? for the club or you just want to be selfish and just go and just do your own thing so that's Celtic that's Aston Villa and as you saw and you before you came in you said Johnny Artson was crying we don't want to get you crying but I'm a big in terms of this show and having control of this show I am trying to bring an insight into the mentality of an athlete uh, of, a, of a winner of a champion uh, of a competitor um, I still now train I've got a hamstring tear at the minute because that helps me um, mentally massively helps me mentally we talked to John the other day and John didn't check his testicles for three years and then he left it to a point where it was touch and go and it was very difficult for him and he battled through it and he got through it and he looks very well and very healthy and he's a great pundit what the difference with you is is that you went through an illness and came back and I want to ask why you wanted to come back why you, what it was about playing again that was important to you but what was the timeline with being diagnosed with leukaemia you're in a foreign country still even though you've been in the UK for a, a while and how did you take this illness on? Um... My, my story, me, me and John, we, we communicate a lot. We, we're very good friends. We, we share the same stories. We, uh, we share the same battles as well. And, um, you know, mine was completely different than John. My, mine, mine, I was diagnosed in a space of three days. Mine came very quick. Mine was a acute lymphoblastic le leukemia, acute ones that come uh, very quickly and they're quite aggressive. Uh, so, so your symptoms were, were, were quick. You knew something wasn't quite uh, right. Just a little cold, nothing special. As, a, as we as a players, we we take the coldness in different way because we're fit, we're strong. The sooner we have something, you know, you know straight away. But you know what? Us, you know that paracetamol taking. Which again, just to give our, uh, our audience an idea and people listening, people watching. 
Um, because of, of uh, drug issues, getting drug tested, uh, physios will say to you at any football club, if you've got aches and pains, a lot of players have had injuries and broken legs and metal work in their, their limbs, uh, anti-inflammatories. So some players will take anti-inflammatories every day. They say, take some milk so it doesn't give you a stomach ulcer. But pretty much apart from that, the only thing you can really take is paracetamol. So paracetamol for a footballer is the kind of, you've got a cold, you've got the man flu, right. you've got this, you're going to take like, paracetamol. Like a, like a little sweet. Yeah, exactly, That's take paracetamol. It's, um, and, and, and you're right, um, around football, the drug, the drug uh, testing has be- became very strict, very strong. Um, so we, we weren't allowed to take mm. anything without being approved from the club. But bear in mind, I was an international player, so I'll play for the club, we'll play the league, then we'll play European games, then we'll play internationally, you'll be traveling all over the place. You, you, at some point, you take some, like a, a, a little a vitamin that you, mm. I wasn't taking anything. Mm. In my life, in my life, bear in mind, I was, I was, um, I was um, diagnosed with leukemia. In my life, I probably had cold once or twice. I haven't took a tablet, I haven't took an antibiotic or anything. If you can explain to me how that happened, nobody knows. I asked the question, so many questions in my head, I've asked the doctors, there's no explanation. So you have a, so you have a cold, what did you do? Did you go and see the physio? Did you think that there's no, something out of the I ordinary here? Because how did you go from a I cold am, to leukemia? How did you get diagnosed? My, Where, what my, happened? My, uh, my kids were young. So when you have a young kids, you know, they go to school, you pick up a little, little cold, you shake it off, you sweat it out, you go on a sauna, mm. you're ready to go. But the problem was uh, that week to build up before um, Arsenal, I, I felt a little bit, little bit exhausted. Uh, I felt like little runny nose and a little bit exhausted. Uh, but you know, I went back home, slept for two hours, go and pick the kids from school. My days are going to normal. The Friday, the Friday before the the game against Arsenal, I had a big sweat in the night. I mean, I, I woke up about. I remember I was saying to my wife, and the next day, about half three in the morning, and my bed was soaked. Mm. It was soaked. But usually because I was usually sweating a lot, I had to take a lot of intake, a lot of fluids, and I had to make sure I hydrated well enough the night before for the game. So maybe it's just the room was too, too, too hot and I sweat, but the sweat was heavy, very heavy. And the next day, obviously, I've had the temperature, you sweat it out, I felt a little bit down, but you know what? Had a coffee, had a breakfast with the boys, we, we, we were talking about the game, so adrenaline kicked in a little bit, you forget about it. Before the game, warm up's going well, everything was perfect, and uh, you know, then the, everything happened. The, the game started, and I start feeling more fatigued and fatigue, and um, the game was keep going. I was, usually I loved playing against Oteta because we had that bat- battle with Rangers, and then he, he moved course, on yeah. to, you know, the Everton, then at Arsenal, and Alex McLeish was the man of the day, and I remember in the halftime he saying to me, Stan, you're second best. Every time you've played against Oteta, you love to play against him, you love to challenge him, you love to be in his face, and you know how to play him. What hap- what, what's happening to that? And I'm like, something is not right. I, I just can't run, my muscle is not reacting. But we were in a very difficult situation, so I remember that James Collins, uh, Stevie Warnock, they jumped in and said, Stan, you always pushed us, you always tell us that we have to fight together because I've just took off my, all my clothes. I, just, I was sitting in naked and I was exhausted. I didn't have energy to fight with them, to argue with them, to talk to them. Which and is a big sign. Big sign for me and it was strange for me. So they all jumped up and I, I felt like, I need to go back on. So I'll say, well, if you want me to go back, I'll go back. But if you made the change already, just just made the change and, and uh, Alex McLeish said, no, put your, your kid on, you're going back for the second half. So in the second half, literally my brain was no near football. I was like, something is happening. Something is not right. My, I kept running, I wasn't doing much. I would just try to cover the boys. I just tried to make sure that I'm there. Was it quite scary? Uh, it wasn't scary, it was strange for me because usually I'm, if I go and play, if I go and trade, it's 100%. I'll go and run, I'll go and challenge, I'll go out demand, that's me. But that day, it wasn't standing for me, it wasn't there. 
I couldn't just go through anything. The game finished. Um, I said to the dog, listen, something is not right. Um, he said, oh, you know what? Get your shower. Uh, get your cold bath because we were playing Chelsea in the following week. Uh, get your cold bath and I'll look at you in, um, in, a, in a bus. So got in the bus, just had a little bit of food, felt, didn't want to eat anything and went to the doc and said, doc, listen, it's, I'm very tired. Uh, I think I've got a little temperature. So I measured my temperature. It wasn't nothing scary or heavy, 37.9. So yeah, you get in a temperature, you probably get a virus. And as a doctor, as in a football, I was important player, you go, you know what, take a couple of antibiotics, let's go through it, let's make sure if it's something, we'll, we'll cut it off straight away. So I took a couple of antibiotics, that was on uh, Saturday night. Sunday we uh, had a day off, I felt okay. Monday, I remember that uh, we went in, uh, and a couple of weeks before that, we had um, Muamba's um, accident. Yes, I was there, I was at the game for Bruce Muamba, Spurs. Yeah. Where the doctor and, uh, came out of the crowd. Exactly. And uh, at that time, I think a lot of the insurance company were demanding more checkups from their clubs, for their players, with the hats. So we had a, a checkup on Monday. And uh, randomly, the doctor said, well, you know what? I want to check the blood for the players just to look at their, you know, if their vitamins are okay, the livers are uh, functioning uh, good. So on a Monday, we had um, uh, the the, the heart checkup and, and the blood test. On a Tuesday, I was away with my wife. We were, we were getting um, a new passports. Uh, you know, it was a lovely day. Uh, we were going for the new passports. I booked my uh, holiday. We were finishing in about three weeks. So we were all, all looking. I had a coffee. We were straw around. And I had a phone call about three o'clock in the afternoon. And um, Dr. Um, um, Ian McGuinness, uh, he just called me and said, Stan, um, I need to speak to you about something. And I went, yeah, of course, Doc, well, what is it? And he said, listen, uh, I want you to go for another blood test on a Wednesday, just to make sure that, uh, you know, we, we're secure. I think everything is okay, but I just want you to go for a blood test. So on a Wednesday, I walk in, uh, the doctor wasn't there. He was with uh, Charles Ogbe away in France mm. to have his uh, treatment. And he said, you have to go with the uh, with, uh, under 21 doctor. So we got in the car, I went for, the, for, for another blood test and um, the under 21 doctor said, listen, we're gonna get a test. They're gonna check your result. And on a Thursday, we're gonna have the results and we'll talk about it. So on a Thursday morning, I turn up in training, uh, but just before I pull in training, I have a phone call from France, from the doctor in McGuinness. He goes, listen, Stan, um, I need to talk to you about something. I said, what is it? I say, uh, I, don't, I don't want you to train today. Uh, I want you to just, uh, you know, get your clothes and I want you to go with doctor, uh, with the under 21 doctor to, um, to the hospital. We need to do some more tests. And I'm like, no, I'm gonna train, we're playing Chelsea. So he was, he was arguing with me and uh, I was like, no, no, I'm training, I'm fine. Everything is okay. So I've completed a full session with them, three 20 minutes game. We're working on a tactic, you know, uh, we're gonna play a lower block. We're gonna hit on a, you know, on the break. And I'll, we're talking about that. After the game, the doctor came and said, listen, Stan, we, we have to go and check you up again. I said, okay, that's fine. Um, so we pulled in in Heartlands. Uh, Obviously, bear in mind, in a car doctor is not saying anything. I just finished training. I'm feeling okay. We start walking down the wards, and I, I can see 17 cancer wards, 18 cancer wards. And I remember the doc said to me, you have to go to ward 19. Went 19 oncology. Strange. But they told me that I'm going to have tests, so... Me and the doctor was in the waiting, uh, in the waiting room. We had two nurses and a doctor, Dr. Lovell. Still remember his name, we still keep in touch with, with him. Put him in a room and, um, you know, sometimes when you think that you've been given a, a news like that, it will be, you know, be, you'll be prepared and that. He just went, listen, 
we think you've got leukemia and I'm 99% positive. What did you, what, what happens? Uh, I couldn't answer. Uh, the word leukemia for me is, if you're not familiar, if you haven't been in touch with it, you haven't not, have a knowledge about it, you wouldn't know. I've been in a couple, me and my wife donated a lot of, um, you know, we've been involved in a lot of um, individual cases with the young kids for transplant, you know, try to raise money, awareness. So we've been part of it, but you're not part of it because you want to help. You want to give somebody a chance, but you don't really know about it. So when I was told, I was like, hold on a second. This is cancer, yeah? It goes, yeah. And it's one of the rare ones. No rare ones, but one of the ones that we have to start treatment straight away. And he said to me, it's a, it's a really strange one, uh, Stephen, because this leukemia either goes with the young kids or very old adults. And you're between. So for us to, to make the right diagnosis was really difficult, but you've got acute lymphoblastic leukemia. This is le leukemia in the blood which what happened, it kills your immune system, and if you don't have immune, immune uh, system to fight, your, the bacteria, the viruses, then you know what is the end. You're a, you're a dad at that stage? Uh, dad of two. A, a dad of two. Husband. husband. Um, son, son of... Son. Yeah. yeah. A professional footballer, a well-known one, a captain. Um, how, how did the next weeks pan out where where do you make sense of it were you right okay i'm a competitor i'm fit let's go into this let's do it uh, because everything that you've told me so far about you as a competitor doing things properly competing uh, answering the call of of a, of a dressing room when you needed did you draw upon all of these things and were you very positive or like many people that go through many different illnesses with the different vulnerabilities along the way well, at the start, is it's not about who I was, it, who I was going to become. That was the biggest thing for me. And if I tell you something, Stanis, walk out of this door, but I don't know what is there. How many thoughts is going to be through your head? What is going to be? Who's going to wait there? What's going to wait for me there? That was for me, which way I'm going to take. First of all, I, I have to break it to my wife, to my parents, and to my kids. This is the biggest challenge for me. Everything else is, I was gonna deal with it as it come. That's not a problem for me. I had to make a phone call to my wife. She was on the way down to London. Uh, I have to tell her to turn back. Uh, she had to come back. And that moment, I had the, the doctor and at the, mom, and at the time that we all traveled, so the one of the features come over. Stu Walker, you probably yes. know. Yes. Yeah. Stu, sure, yeah. Old Stu, he didn't say a word. We still have a joke about it. He's, he came, so my wife walked in the room. At that time, I, didn't cry. I, I couldn't cry. I said to myself, I won't cry. I'll stay strong. I'll make sure that I'll show my wife, as I always did, and my kids that I will deal with it. I'll deal with it in the right way. This sounds like the captain in yeah. the dressing room. And I had to be a captain of my family as well. So my wife walk in, uh, obviously she sees now. She walked in too, she's a smart uh, girl. And she said, what's happening? This is, this is not, I thought you were dehydrated. I thought you, um, you just had a, you know, because I was working very hard and I was doing extra training that you got exhaustion. Or something, something is not right, what, what's happening? I said, listen, I'm gonna tell you, but we'll deal with it. So I said, I've got leukemia. At that moment, I, I wasn't crying. She just burst crying and I had to go and I just cried. We cried for a bit, wiped my tears and I went, listen, now we start. I have to start treatment straight away. But first thing one I have to do is, I have to have a second opinion. I'm not having anything of that. It can't just tell me now I've completed a 90 minutes a mad. professional session. I can't get my head around uh, 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 the fact that you've that you've that you are in the middle of 
you know, three weeks left to go at the end of the season. You've just played Arsenal, big club. Chelsea's coming. You've done your session. You're kind of asking yourself questions. Am I fit? Am I not fit? Is this the sweats? Whatever it is. You get diagnosed and they are not just the diagnosis. A lot of people would say, well, I've got an appointment in three weeks time or two months time or six months time and they can get their head around it. You've been plunged right into this. With, so, Straight so, into it. So did you get a second opinion? Yes. And uh, it's funny... <laughs> Mario knew at the time. Mario knew was my guy for a long time, and um, when you work with somebody, you you know him very well. And if you're you're familiar, the, uh, Geraldine, his wife, yes. fought different kind of leukemia, but Mario knew was always so um, so talking with the great words about the doctor that looked and the professor that looked after Ger- Geraldine. It's called David Lynch. So at that time, everything is racing. The doctor, you won't give me any advice. The club doctor, Stu, head down, you won't say a word. The nurses, they were like, uh, you have to choose what's going to happen. Dr. Lowell, yeah, uh, yeah, you can go for a second opinion, but where you want to go. All of a sudden, you have to make decision. Decision that you, it's in an area that you don't know anything about it. So what I had to do is, I had to... F- Call Sharon, the the secretary of the club, and Brilliant. I said, "Listen, I I need the sec. Uh, I need to find Martin O'Neill up in Sunderland." I remember it was about quarter to twelve, and um, I got the number. I've called the the secretary of Sunderland, and I spoke to her, and I said, "Listen, I'd like to speak with Martin O'Neill." And she was like, "Oh, we can't disturb him. He's in training." I said, "It's urgent," so I had to break it to her. Say, "Listen, this is the case. This is what's happening. I need him." In two minutes time, Martin was on the phone and he was like, you know, his sympathy and what I can help. I said, listen, I said, Gaffer, one thing I want to know is the doctor that you always spoke so highly of, can I have his number? I need a second opinion and I have to do it now. He said, you know, Ostilian, he's down in London. He's one of the leading uh, professors uh, uh, in, in that area. Let's see if he's down there. So he called him first and he said, Stillian is in London. He's expecting your call called him spoke to him two minutes uh, he knew already knew about it uh, Martin explained to him and he said listen can you come down to London and I say I'm um, getting on the train now I'll see you in two hours time in two hours time uh, he, he had about another three professors so he had his AML different kind of leukemia he had uh, the one of the best in university hospital down in London involving ALL, which is acute lymphoblastic leukemia, and he had another one who is a cancer specialist. Did none of this phase you? uh, No, I was just in a zone to understand, is that just a fault or just a misunderstanding? I was still, my brain was still racing to, this is a fault, this is not right, this can't happen. I can't be fit, strong, I never had a cold, and all of a sudden this. So obviously he, 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 tra- he checked my limbs, he checked my, uh, my blood again. Uh, and in about 40 minutes he said to him, yes, I can confirm you've got ALL, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. You have to start the treatment straight away. My wife was sitting beside me. Stuart was sitting beside me. They're looking at me and you know what? You're the one that make the decision. You're the one. I said, okay, what what is the what is the treatment? How long is the treatment? What's happening? He said, and he what he struck me. He said, he said, let's take first six months as he come. And I went what do you first mean? six months. First six months as he come. And he said to me, uh, just to let you know, the success rate with kids success rate is ninety percent, very high which is very good. Older ones, 26%. The ones at your age, we still don't have number because not many have this kind of leukemia. So I'm going to, uh, you're gonna rate me as the older ones. You go, we have to. I said, well, that's good enough for me. So and that day I left with a tablet, uh, one tablet of uh, chemotherapy and a big dose of steroids. And I said to my wife, we are starting. Now we're gonna start that journey together. 
what's going to come up, I'll tell you one thing, I'm going to put every single energy and everything I've got that I'll fight and I'll survive. If anything, if it comes to the worst, at least I've tried and you will be beside me. This was the, this was the conversation we had about a fight and we never touched it again. What was the lowest point of your treatment? Where should I start? It was so many, uh, so many low points. He, he, the highlight of my three year treatment was, I was fighting every single day to hear the news, you're in remission. And you've got another, another month of chemotherapy. You know, when you say to people that you actually looked forward for the chemotherapy, people say, what do you mean? What are you talking about? can't look at, uh, forward to a chemotherapy say, so I was looking forward to it. John Hartson says that um, that he was, his doctors told him that he was a textbook case because the chemotherapy had such a positive, of course it kills good and bad in your body, but it had such a positive impact on him. And one of those reasons that they felt was because of, he, he was an athlete, you, you, your, your heart is bigger and stronger. You, you, you bra- your mentality is strong and you're still in the game. So did you feel, Again, going back to this fundamental question, being a competitor, being an athlete, being selfish in the right way, being a captain, massively helped your fight. Yeah, I would say yes. But the most important thing that helped me is my, uh, my desire to achieve. This is what is about. We, as a young boy, as a footballer, as a person, I, I had that desire to always improve, always achieve, always push. And I wasn't going to stop, especially in this battle. I just couldn't stop. You know, in moments like that, Stanley, you realize what you're losing. And it's the most precious things in life. And that's your life. Because we talk about, you know, you're talking about money, mental issues. You're talking about little things in life. But if you don't have that life, you won't be able to fight it. You won't be able to push through it. You won't be able to talk about it. You won't be just, you won't exist. So did you almost relish the battle? Yeah, I had to. I had to. Because for me, it was about surviving. And surviving is grabbing, taking, using everything that you've got that you can succeed. Because is it the right right treatment? A lot of people go through treatment like that, but don't make it. This is the right chemotherapy. This is the right. You've got different way of treatments, and it gets better and better. Does it? Did that illness came to me when actually the the treatment was better than years before? If I had the years before, maybe I could. I wouldn't survive. I always believe everything happened for a reason. Final couple of questions. When did you hear those words? You are in remission, and how did you feel? Where were you? I was, I was over the moon. I, I just couldn't wipe my smile off the face. I couldn't, couldn't wait to go home and tell, you know, my kids that, you know, we want to do something. You know, I won't tell them that I'm in remission. I just wanted to do something for them. I was tired. I, I was, you know, but inside me, I knew that I'm going in the right direction. And I'll, this, my kids, my wife, will have a chance to see me for longer, to be beside them, to guide them, to, to make them happy, because this is what it's all about, the family is all about. And I was given a chance to go further and further in their lives, to see them growing, to see them growing as a, as a good kids, as a, as a grown man, a grown man. And I said to my wife, you know what? After everything we've been through, if, it's, if I see a grandchildren, it'll be a great achievement. Will be a great achievement, bigger than anything they have achieved in football. And when you went back and played in our famous Claret and Blue again, and I've got to admit, I'm emotional now, but I was even more emotional at the time because lots of football's a very small village, it's a very small family. Um, and knowing that you went back to the club and then played 21s, is that was that for you? Was that a realistic expect? Was that was that? Uh, I put my football career on hold to take on this battle. I need to prove to myself what what was the reason for going back to the sport and wanting to play again. First of all, was when I when I went through my battle, I, I got in, uh, a lot of people got in touch with me. People that survived cancer, 
And um, they talked to me about their life after cancer because a lot of people struggle with it. Mm. A lot of people have their moment finding jobs, hiding because they had cancer. They think it's a disease that should, people should not, don't know about it. But I always tell them that you should be proud of it. You should be proud that you went at that end. You should push. And it's a life afterwards. So first of all, I wanted to show that it's life afterwards and you can ach still achieve things after your battle with cancer. And the other thing is, I just love football. And it was taken away from me. It ripped me apart. Because going back to our start of the interview, why I wanted to go to Scotland, why I want to make it, because I had idols. I've, I've sacrificed my life to become a footballer, to play football, to play and be and act in the right way as a footballer. This is what this was what was football about, about, and this is what football meant to me. When I first started, bear in mind, I've, I've, I've gained about probably, I was playing at 85, I was heavy as 139s, you can do the maths, very heavy. When I put it in my head first, I knew how, how hard I had to work. I had that opportunity, it was given to me, and it was given to me by the club that, that I loved because the fans was incredible. I had, you know, the 19 minutes uh, uh, yes, uh, applause. applause. Uh, it was incredible. And I wanted to do it again. You know, people ask me why I didn't go and do it everywhere else. I didn't want to go and do it anywhere else. It's not about playing a full season. I just, even if I played two games and I say no, I would show people that, first of all, it's a life afterwards. And secondly, I would say no. I went through a very difficult um, a pre season. I had to sacrifice a lot. I remember, um, I hope you, if you have Gabby one day. And yes, Gabby Bong the whole. I remember some of the runs. I haven't missed a session. Bear in mind, I, had, I went through the most difficult leukemia treatment for three years. Imagine how much uh, chemotherapy, steroids, everything I've What, did, what did the doctors with. say to you about going back and training? Did they say oh. your, your, your body's in a good position now to be able to do it, no. or did they say don't do no. it? They said to me, my, my professor say, this is, this, is the this is the weirdest thing I've ever heard, and I think it's really bad, because he said when, so when you have so much chemotherapy and steroids, your bones become weaker, Mm. So you are very, very fragile. You can break a leg. And I said, you know what? That's not the important thing. How is my organs? How is my heart? How is my liver? How is my legs? Can I say, you know what? If you go through a training session, why not? And I said, I'm going through it. And my professor was like, we, we still talk about it. He said, you know what? I've never seen something like that. This is incredible. I went through the preseason. I loved it. I loved it being with the boys again. It was very hard, you know. Doing the preseason mm. with the Italian manager, mm. it's hard. A lot of running. A lot of running. We went to Austria. It was double sessions. A lot of running. I remember one of the the sessions. Uh, one of the the runs. We were doing a lot. Of completely different runs. Is long runs. And I remember the last run. It was I was in the same group with. I mean, as you always say, Gabby. I've just recovered from cancer. Are you you're running in the same group as me? <laughs> Shouldn't be a disaster that for you. And he just laughed. But in the last run, I remember last day, I was on my, literally my knee because we were training twice every day. It was so hot, it was 40 degrees. And I remember in the last session, we only left 12 of us because everybody else was injured, they, they, they couldn't train. They saw what was coming. It was, <laughs> and uh, you know, last run, I was like, we were doing uh, times. So I was like in the back of the group and I would just try to get a last run. And I remember Rooney, uh, Rudy Gestet and Gabby just slowing down just behind me and they just give me the massive push so I can make to the, to the, the time. And this is just show you how, how people see you when you, you know, and when they said to me, no, it was another disappointment for me, but I couldn't say much. I, it hurt me a lot, but I had to take it. I had to understand that as well. And, you know, if I had that opportunity to play again, I would have loved it. A lot of people, a lot of people that suffered with cancer and survived cancer would have benefited with it. To see 
that people can achieve and can do a lot of stuff and can still be live their life after the uh, cancer treatment. So it was a disappointment for me, my own disappointment. I didn't, I, my thought and my, my view was that uh, the club didn't have to make that decision yet. I didn't rush in for a contract. I just wanted to finish as a, as a footballer. That was all. I don't think you can ask for more. You don't ask for contracts. You don't ask for money. And you still don't, can't get it. But it was disappointing. It was painful. But you know what? I still love this club and I'll still cheer him up like you do every, every single week. And will always be in my heart. All it leaves me to say is a quite fascinating uh, sit down and chat with you. You're a leader, you're a legend, and, and most importantly, a very good man. And I know a lot of Villa fans already know that, but it's important that they know, they hear people like me say that uh, to you. Yes, you finished your career, but you finished your career as a villain, and that's the most important thing. Still in Petrov, Pleasure. thank you very much for joining me on Pleasure. The Last Word with Stan Collymore. Thank you. The Last Word with Stan Collymore.